a successful doctor leading a double life, a desperate future mother, a vigilant twin sister, and an overheard conversation that opened the innocent victim's eyes to what was happening, this story had all the ingredients to become one of the most sensational. However, the media largely overlooked it. And yet, the story unfolded in Ohio in the 2000s, following the best traditions of Greek tragedy. It took not just one, but two traps cleverly set to catch the perpetrator, whose actions and motives will make you reconsider how confident you are in the people to whom you open your doors and your heart. At the age of 33, Michelle Baker was ready to become a wife and mother. Happiness seemed to be on the horizon when her friend introduced her to the pleasant young doctor, Maynard Munsing II. Maynard, also 33 years old, had previous experience in married life. Michelle worked in the fire department and was an EMT, so they also shared common interests in the medical field, and a desire to help people. Michelle believed, that she had won the lucky ticket because successful, attractive, and charming Maynard was the dream of any woman. Michelle and Maynard's relationship resembled a modern-day fairy tale. Within just one month, her boyfriend moved into Michelle's house in Hoover Heights, Ohio. On weekends, Maynard's children from a previous marriage would come over. Michelle witnessed the joy with which Maynard spent time with his kids and was confident that he would be overjoyed when she told him that he would be a father again. She was not mistaken, his happiness knew no bounds. Maynard immediately began looking for a new home where the young family could live together and selected a lovely and cozy nest for $320,000. Michelle couldn't believe her luck when Maynard suggested they visit Key West, Florida, where they would tie the knot at sunset, standing barefoot on the sandy beach. The enamored couple set off for Florida, but on the very first day of their romantic weekend, Maynard had a change of heart asking Michelle to postpone the spontaneous wedding in order to have a traditional ceremony where his relatives could be present. Since Michelle still desperately dreamed of having a family, she turned a blind eye to this clearly contrived excuse. That evening, the two went out for dinner at a restaurant. The dinner went well, but after leaving the restaurant, Michelle experienced a sharp pain in her abdomen, and noticed some slight bleeding. Naturally, she was scared of the possibility of losing the baby. Fortunately, her fiancé was a doctor, and he reassured her that there was nothing to worry about. He put her to bed and asked her to try to sleep. The next day, the pain did subside. However, upon returning home, Michelle decided it wouldn't hurt to see her doctor, Dr. John Shea. She breathed a sigh of relief when the doctor assured her that the fetus was developing normally. He was confident that Michelle was simply worried because it was her first pregnancy. Given her previous history of endometriosis, she feared it might have an impact on the fetus. But Michelle's pregnancy was difficult. Spasms of unknown origin, and unexplained bleeding became constant companions for her, baffling the medical professionals who couldn't find an obvious explanation. As if the physical agony wasn't enough, Maynard, who was soon to be Michelle's husband and the father of their child, deemed it the perfect time to confess his lingering feelings for his ex-girlfriend, Tammy Irwin, despite their complicated past. To all their friends, Maynard had portrayed Tammy as a terrible person, but now it turned out that he couldn't forget her. Understanding that this was the real reason behind her boyfriend's postponement of the wedding, Michelle appreciated his honesty and decided not to end the relationship, but instead work on it even harder. But Michelle's faith in her future husband quickly evaporated on the 1st of July, 2000. Maynard left town for a fishing trip with a friend, while Michelle stayed home, tending to her own tasks. Engrossed in her activities, Michelle turned on the radio and tuned into a local station. Suddenly, she was struck like thunder when she heard her beloved ordering a song for another girl. The caller's voice was identical to Maynard's. Michelle froze in place, listening intently to the conversation. The DJ asked the man his name, and Michelle's heart sank when he replied, Maynard. She had suspicions about where her fiancé really was. She asked her neighbor to drive her to the home of Maynard's ex-girlfriend, Tammy. Her suspicions were confirmed when she saw them together on the street. Michelle approached the man and declared that she was breaking up with him. 
Tammy joined the conversation, revealing that she didn't even know Maynard was living with Michelle. He had been telling her that he was staying with a friend. Michelle promptly kicked the unfaithful fiancé out of her home. But the man didn't waste any time to win Michelle's favor again. A few days later, he called her, inviting her for a picnic so they could talk. The man apologized for his mistake and asked Michelle if they could get back together. He seemed so sincere that she forgave him. But the picnic had to be interrupted when Michelle started feeling very unwell. She was in such a bad condition that she couldn't even leave the restroom located in the park. Her cramps and bleeding returned, but this time, new symptoms appeared, she couldn't keep any food down. Michelle hurried to the doctor, who couldn't find anything serious. The ultrasound showed that the baby was fine, and the doctor concluded that the cause of her symptoms was stress. However, Michelle's twin sister noticed an interesting coincidence. She asked Michelle if it seemed strange to her that every time they spent time with Maynard, she experienced unbearable pain. Michelle was horrified by what her sister suggested. She remembered that Maynard had brought glasses from the bar during their dinner in Florida, shortly before she felt sick the first time. And he had also poured her drink at the picnic before the second intense pain episode. But what could he have done with her drinks? Although their relationship seemed to have returned to normal, and they had even talked about the wedding again, Michelle couldn't ignore her sister's logical observation, nor could she shake off the feeling that Maynard hadn't completely ended things with his ex-girlfriend. When Maynard told Michelle that he would take the children to Florida for the weekend, Michelle once again trusted her instinct and drove to Tammy's house, where her fiancé's car was parked. She saw two people inside and was able to eavesdrop on their conversation through an open window. What she heard left her speechless. Tammy asked Maynard what he planned to do about the child, to which he replied that he believed he had already dealt with it. That's when Michelle realized she had no choice but to involve the police to keep Maynard away from the child as much as possible. Michelle went to the police and told them about her suspicions. However, upon hearing her story, the detectives were skeptical and couldn't believe that someone would attempt something so fantastical. In all their years of police work, they had never encountered anything like it. The police wanted Michelle to undergo a lie detector test, but department regulations prohibited testing expectant mothers. Therefore, they dismissed the idea and straightforwardly informed her that they would need substantial evidence for the arrest of Dr. Mansinger due to his professional standing. In the meantime, there was little they could do, so Michelle had to take matters into her own hands. Michelle proved herself to be a true detective. Asking her friend for help, she hid a small video camera in an artificial plant on the kitchen counter and positioned the flower in such a way that the camera captured everything happening behind the kitchen table. Then, in the spirit of famous spies, she invited her boyfriend to dinner and casually asked him to pour her a soda while she flipped steaks on the grill outside. When Maynard handed Michelle her glass, she excused herself under some innocent pretense and went to the bathroom, where she poured the soda into a bottle. On the bottom of the glass, to her horror, she discovered residue of some substance, and not just a small amount, but a noticeable quantity of some kind of drug. Nonetheless, trying not to reveal her state of shock, she calmly poured the soda from the hidden bottle into the glass and returned to the table. But Michelle couldn't calmly continue dinner because Maynard kept receiving calls from Tammy. Finally, he left, but later he called Michelle and asked, do you know why Tammy is upset? After learning that her fiancé had been drugging her drinks, Michelle wasn't particularly concerned about Tammy's feelings. However, she politely asked why Tammy was upset. And Maynard shocked her once again with another confession, they had secretly married a little earlier that week. As hurt and angry as Michelle was about her beloved's betrayal, it all paled in comparison to her determination to protect her future child. She promptly took the bottle with the soda to the police. An expert determined that the soda had been laced with Cytotec. This medication is used to treat stomach ulcers and induce labor, but it can also have fatal consequences for the fetus when used irresponsibly. The detectives believed Michelle, but from a legal standpoint, they had a problem. 
They lacked evidence that specifically proved Maynard put the substance in the glass. An experienced lawyer would argue in court that Michelle tampered with it herself to frame her unfaithful fiancé. Therefore, the police set up their own trap. During one of Maynard's phone calls, the detectives asked Michelle to tell him that her pregnancy was progressing normally, prompting him to invite her for dinner and add another dose of the substance. On August 14, 2000, two police officers conceal a tiny camera in a firefighter figurine, positioned on Michelle's kitchen counter, while they hid in the garage. As soon as they witnessed Maynard attempting to offer Michelle one of his special cocktails, the police burst into the kitchen and arrested him for attempted murder. I hope these are prenatal vitamins, one of the officers said to Maynard, pointing at the mysterious substance in his hands. Inside Maynard's car, the police found even larger quantities of the same substance. Laboratory tests confirmed the presence of Cytotec in the drink, leaving the doctor with no choice but to admit his guilt. Mansing offered a remorseful explanation for his heinous crime. Essentially, he admitted that he poisoned his former fiancée to eliminate the problem. When asked if he considered the child a problem, Maynard answered affirmatively. Michelle continued to visit the doctor every week, and underwent ultrasound scans every month. Despite several doses of the substance, it seemed that the fetus was developing normally. However, at 28 weeks of pregnancy, just before Maynard's trial, Michelle went into labor. Her daughter, whom she named McKaylee, was stillborn. Family and friends gathered around Michelle in the hospital room, where they had the opportunity to say their final goodbyes to McKaylee and hold her one last time. The coroner was unable to find traces of the substance in the placenta, unable to establish, and determine whether McKaylee's death was a result of the effects of Cytotech. To protect Michelle and her family from a painful legal process, prosecutors made deals with Maynard and Tammy. Tammy admitted her guilt in obtaining the medication with a prescription as a nurse. She was sentenced to five years of probation and 100 hours of community service. Maynard was sentenced to five years in prison. The two spouses would never be able to work in the medical field in the USA again. During the trial, Maynard shocked those present in the courtroom by stating that the loss of the child was an act of a higher power. Maynard Mansing not only showed no signs of remorse during the sentencing, and did not ask for Michelle's forgiveness but claimed that their daughter's death was the will of a higher power, and he would become a stronger person after the incident. Even Judge Barbara Gorman was taken aback by his statement. I must say, it was one of the strangest statements I have ever heard, Judge Gorman told Maynard. I personally think you are a disgrace to your profession. This is all the result of your actions. You need to take responsibility for what happened. The sentence given to the spouses can be considered relatively lenient. But Michelle knows that someday Maynard will answer for what he has done in the afterlife. In the meantime, she decided to hit him where it hurt the most, his wallet. In August 2002, Michelle Baker filed a $3.5 million lawsuit against Maynard and Tammy Mansing for what happened to her daughter. Maynard repeatedly stated orally, and in writing what his intentions were. He wanted to get rid of the child. His wife did not want him to have any involvement with the child. Therefore, Michelle's lawyers were confident they would win the case. Although it is not reported whether Michelle's lawsuit was successful, it was revealed in 2007 that Mansing declared bankruptcy. The Mansing name resurfaced in 2013 in the obituary of Maynard's father, a well-known local founder of several youth organizations. The note mentioned, among other things, that Tammy and Maynard Mansing were still married and living in Ohio. It is unclear whether Mansing intended to kill Michelle, but at the very least, he decided to terminate her pregnancy without her consent. And yet, Maynard could have achieved what he wanted without his despicable plan because Michelle explicitly told him that she did not ask him to be involved in the child's life or provide financial support. He undoubtedly knew how much Michelle desired to become a mother and heartlessly deprived her of that opportunity just to start a new family life with a clean slate.
On June 4, 2019, the body of 19-year-old Cynthia Hoffman was found in Anchorage, Alaska. The girl was immobilized before the killer cowardly shot her in the back of the head. Cynthia's father, Timothy Hoffman, reported her disappearance. He also revealed that Cynthia was not an ordinary 19-year-old girl, as her mental capacity was that of a 12-year-old. Speculating about who could have committed such an act against the young and trusting Cynthia, you might have thought of a stranger, a monster, attacking her on a secluded trail, because anyone who knew Cynthia would never have done such a thing. But this crime was not committed by a stranger. The killer turned out to be someone whom Cynthia considered her best friend. Cynthia Hoffman, or simply Cece, was born on October 8, 1999, into the family of Timothy and Barbara Hoffman. Despite facing difficulties with learning, she was accustomed to setting goals for herself and pursuing them with unwavering determination. This attitude enabled her to successfully graduate from high school and start learning how to drive. With her remarkable work ethic, she easily secured a job at a diner and eventually decided to assist her father in his construction and repair business. He recalls that she was his right-hand person. In reality, Cynthia had been helping her father with a new project and was supposed to meet her sister to collect her earnings. The girls had planned to go shopping at the mall. Cynthia sent her father a message to let him know she was on her way to her sister's, but she never showed up and stopped answering phone calls. Timothy immediately grew concerned as it was completely out of character for Cynthia. All his children knew that whether they were in school or at church, if their father called, they were expected to answer. Consequently, Timothy promptly contacted the police to report his daughter's disappearance. While the police were actively searching for Cynthia, Timothy couldn't sit still, not knowing where his daughter was. Therefore, he and his friends, who were bikers, rode through all the parks and forest trails where Cynthia might have been. He also spoke with the last person who saw Cece before her disappearance, her best friend, 18-year-old Angela. Angela confirmed that they had met on that day, but at Cynthia's request, she dropped her off at the local amusement park. Around 4 p.m., Angela sent Timothy several messages, assuring him that Cynthia was not answering her calls and expressing her deep concern for her friend. Angela and Cynthia had met while attending the local school. Due to Cynthia's developmental delay, she was eager to be accepted by the popular girls, so she was thrilled about her new friendship with Angela. Timothy was also pleased that his daughter was befriending Angela, knowing that someone as sensitive and vulnerable as his daughter needed the support of peers. The girls began spending time together, with Cynthia often talking about Angela, inviting her over, and even sharing a photo of them together on social media with the caption, My Best Friend. What Cynthia didn't know was that Angela was not her friend. In fact, Angela wasn't even her real name. The girl's name was Denali Bramer, and at the same time when Timothy Hoffman was restless, not knowing where his daughter was, Denali Bramer knew exactly where Cynthia was. On the evening of June 3, 2019, a call was made to the police by Denali's mother, Nicole House. It was only then that the pieces of the puzzle began to fit together. The woman revealed that on the evening of June 2nd, her daughter and a boy whom she knew as Anthony were at her home, and they told her that Anthony shot Cece in the head and pushed her into the water. She added that she hadn't seen Denali since she heard this shocking confession. It was entirely unclear what prompted the two to make this admission, but the detectives decided to talk to Denali personally. When they spoke the next day, she offered her version of what happened on June 2nd. First and foremost, she claimed that the boy's name wasn't Anthony. It was 16-year-old Caden McIntosh. She stated that they, along with Cece, were hanging out smoking marijuana in a valley 50 kilometers north of Anchorage. On their way back to Anchorage, the group decided to stop at the parking lot of the popular tourist area, Thunderbird Falls, as they thought it would be fun to tie each other up with duct tape and take some photos. So they all went into the forest, where they tied Cynthia's ankles and wrists with duct tape. They also taped her mouth shut. According to Denali, at that moment, Cynthia panicked. They began removing the tape from her mouth and wrists, but Cynthia suddenly threatened to tell the police how they had abducted and tortured her. That's when Caden snatched the weapon from Denali's hands and shot Cynthia. Despite being injured, Cynthia was still alive when Caden pushed her into the water. Then Caden and Denali returned to the parking lot where they had left their car and drove to a local park, where they burned Cynthia's clothes, documents, and bag. Denali allegedly instructed Denali to send a message to Cynthia's sister, stating that she had dropped her friend off at the park. Denali concluded her story, 
assuring the police that she was afraid of Caden, so she did as he instructed. The police found it hard to believe Denali's story, not the least, because she happened to have a loaded weapon during the outing with her friends. However, when the detectives interrogated Caden, his story surprisingly aligned with the girl's narrative. Except for his claim that he blacked out at some point, he confirmed that he did indeed shoot Cynthia and push her into the river. He also mentioned that she was still alive when he pushed her into the water, and he wasn't sure whether Cynthia died from drowning or from the gunshot wound. Then the boy added a crucial statement that shed light on the true nature of the relationship between Denali and Caden. He stated that he didn't want the girl to go to jail. Denali had accused him of the murder, but instead of starting to deny everything or trying to blame her, Caden took all the blame upon himself. It became evident that Denali wasn't afraid of Caden. Either he was afraid of her or felt some form of affection for her and was afraid of losing her. It's also possible that Denali persuaded the boy to take all the blame because she, in the eyes of the law, was an adult, whereas he was not. She faced a potential life sentence, while Caden was a homeless teenager who had never had issues with the law before, and his punishment could have been much lighter. It became clear to the police what kind of person Denali was. She found vulnerable people, such as Cynthia or Caden, whom she could manipulate and do whatever she needed. In any case, the police obtained a confession from Caden, and his testimony fully matched Denali's. At that moment, they probably thought the case was closed, but this story took another sharp turn. When the police examined Denali's iPhone for possible additional information relevant to the investigation, they found something that sent shivers down their spines. In the phone, they found evidence that Denali was taking indecent photos of minors. The evidence of the existence of such photographs and videos became evident through the correspondence between Denali and a man who was saved in the phone under a pet name. Under pressure from the police, the girl revealed that the man's name was Tyler and that he was a millionaire from Kansas. They met online, started communicating, and three weeks before Cynthia's death, Tyler made a deal with Denali. If she essentially orchestrated the assault and murder of someone from Alaska, he would pay her $9 million. Surprisingly, instead of saying no, blocking Tyler or calling the police, Denali agreed. She then persuaded four other teenagers to help her carry out the plan and promised to share the money with them, which she had not yet received. In addition to Caden McIntosh, she struck a deal with 19-year-old Caleb Leyland, whose involvement involved lending his car to Caden and Denali for half a million dollars, which they used to drive Cynthia into the woods. Two other teenagers, a boy and a girl whose identities are not disclosed due to their age, were also involved. The police do not reveal the extent to which the teenagers were involved in the case, but according to local media, the teenage girl said she was present during the planning of the murder, and the boy admitted to agreeing to help abduct and kill Cynthia. It is possible that they were also victims in some way because Caleb is also being tried for having a relationship with a minor, and it may have been the same girl. Timothy Hoffman, who knows more about the case than the public, mentioned that one of the teenagers is trying to portray themselves as a victim, but he didn't buy it. They all planned it together, chose Cynthia as their victim, and if any of them had a conscience, they could have anonymously reported the impending crime. Here's what really happened. At the instigation of Tyler, the five friends chose Cynthia to carry out their horrific plan. The group gathered together, planned the crime, and discussed how they would split the payment for taking the life of their best friend. Then, on June 2nd, under the guise of an innocent walk, Denali and Caden brought the 19-year-old girl to the trail at the Thunderbird Falls tourist area, a popular path that runs through a birch forest and leads to a magnificent 60-meter waterfall. Instead of going there, the group veered off the trail and headed along the Eklutna River. They went further into the forest until they reached a remote clearing, where they offered Cynthia to take photos tied up with adhesive tape. It's quite possible that at that moment, Cynthia still believed it was just a game. So she agreed, but it wasn't a game at all. While Caden was killing the girl with Denali's gun, Denali herself took photos and videos of Cynthia while she was still alive, which she later sent to Tyler from Kansas via Snapchat. However, there was a hitch. Her new friend Tyler from Kansas was not actually Tyler, did not live in Kansas, and certainly was not a millionaire. Moreover, he looked nothing like the photos that Denali had sent. Tyler turned out to be 21-year-old Darren Schillmiller from New Salisbury, Indiana. Darren spent a lot of time on dating websites, 
using someone else's photo and name, of course. The police already knew his name. In 2018, using the same number as the one used to correspond with Denali, he communicated with a woman from California, with whom he discussed his, at the very least, strange inclinations. He asked the woman to send him photos of her young child along with pictures of dirty diapers. Furthermore, in New Salisbury, Darren's obsession with children's photos was a well-known secret. Although his acquaintances never believed he would kill someone, they were aware of his inclinations because he often persuaded local women to share photos of their children with him. Here's who Denali's new friend turned out to be. And if Denali had been able to easily manipulate her friends, Darren proved to be just as capable. Of course, after Cynthia's murder, Denali didn't receive a cent of the promised million. But together with Darren, she began planning another murder. Why? The suggestion was that Darren was angry with Denali because she killed Cynthia, but did not sexually assault her, despite that being Darren's main interest. As a result, he forced her to adhere to the terms of the deal and do whatever he wanted to get the money. Furthermore, Darren resorted to blackmailing Denali by threatening to report Cynthia's murder to the police if she didn't take indecent pictures of children for him. These were the very pictures whose existence the police found while examining Denali's iPhone. Under Darren's direction, the girl photographed two girls, one of whom was 15 years old and the other was eight or nine years old. After Denali's arrest, her two older sisters spoke to the media and shed light on why the girl grew up to be such a cruel person. She was the third child in a family of five girls, all of whom were taken away from their mother by child protective services at various times. The patients of social workers ran out on the day when a man who was living with the girl's mother killed their two-month-old sister, Gabriella. After that, Denali was adopted, and her adoptive family gave her the opportunity to break the cycle of violence, but Denali chose a different path, as her sisters believed that what happened had a profound impact on her. Denali, Caden, Caleb, and Darren were charged with first-degree murder, among other things. After Caden's confession, prosecutors decided to try him as an adult. The four underage accomplices were charged with conspiracy to commit the crime. If the main conspirators are found guilty, they could face a maximum prison sentence of 99 years. However, the trial has been postponed several times due to the enormous amount of information collected by the police. The prosecutors handed over 56 gigabytes of materials to the attorneys. In printed form, this amounts to more than 100,000 pages. In particular, the correspondence between Denali and Darren alone spans over 60,000 pages. Meanwhile, as the prosecutors and lawyers examine the case materials, the relatives and friends of Cynthia are left to wait and hope that the culprits will not escape justice. Timothy Hoffman has been living with one goal since the day a police officer knocked on his door, delivering news that any father dreads hearing. All I want is for them to pay for what they did, and none of them better walk free as long as I'm on this earth, he declares. All six of those accused of Cynthia's murder should get used to seeing her father often, as he promises to be present at every hearing. I hope they get all 99 years they deserve. I don't think they should be out walking free. There's enough evil in each one of them to do it again. Cynthia didn't do anything wrong. Cynthia was a wonderful girl. She just wanted to be friends with them, and now she's dead. Today we will leave behind our everyday worries at home and head to the sun-drenched beaches of San Pedro, a city island on the eastern coast of Belize. This tropical paradise is known for its luxurious hotels, wild evenings, crystal clear waters, and since May 2021, the suspicious death of the chief police superintendent. Clearly, even paradise can become a prison. Jasmine Harton learned this lesson firsthand when she traded her comfortable lifestyle for a cell in one of the world's worst prisons. But was it truly a crime or a terrible mistake? His story begins on May 7, 2021, at the entrance to the newest exclusive Alaya Hotel in San Pedro. 32-year-old Jasmine Harton stood alongside her children as her boyfriend and business partner, 43-year-old Andrew Ashcroft, ceremoniously cut the red ribbon, marking the hotel's opening. Jasmine had spent months meeting with Belizean officials, and Andrew had spent millions from his billionaire father, British Lord Michael Ashcroft's fortune, but their goal was achieved. Jasmine watched Andrew wave to the crowd, a position she had worked hard to attain in society. 
She grew up in a small farming town in Canada with eight siblings. Her parents often struggled to feed their children, and her mother would resort to trickery, convincing workers at the local bakery that she had pigs on the farm, and they would exchange stale bread for her. It was a treat for the family. Like many children from small towns, Jasmine dreamed of seeing the world and wanted to leave her family's home someday. After high school, she became a dental assistant and with a missionary company providing dental services to people who otherwise wouldn't have access, she traveled to many countries around the world. It was in 2014 that she found herself in Belize and here her goals changed. She began working as a real estate agent and became part of the elite circle of local society. In the same year, she met the man who would change her life forever, Andrew Ashcroft. He had been living in Belize for about 20 years and was the youngest son of British Lord Michael Ashcroft, who owned a port, a telephone company, and several hotels in Belize. They got engaged in 2016, and a year later they became parents to twins, Charlie and Elle. But Jasmine didn't want to just date a wealthy businessman. She wanted to become his partner and build something together. Her dream came true with the grand opening of the Alaya Hotel. Their relationship never quite solidified into marriage, even after the birth of their children. Perhaps that was for the best. After all, their marriage couldn't fall apart if it didn't exist, right? After a long day of drinks and socializing with guests, Jasmine and Andrew retired to separate bedrooms. The next two weeks passed in a blur. Jasmine carried out her duties as the director of the new hotel during the day and maintained her reputation as a socialite at night disappearing into bars where she could be herself, free from the need to conform to the image of the Lord's son's girlfriend. Perhaps it was a pleasant escape. Unfortunately, her next outing would mark the beginning of a scandalous saga that would drastically change her life. On May 22nd, 42-year-old police superintendent Henry Jemmett woke up to a sharp phone call. He was surprised to see that his friend Jasmine Harton was calling. She quickly spoke, her voice trembling with fear. Henry told her to stay where she was and wait for his arrival. An hour later, he pulled up to the specified address and found Jasmine waiting for him on the road. She quickly got into his car and thanked him for coming to her rescue. The woman was in a terrible state. The attack turned out to be more serious than he had thought. Jasmine explained that friends had invited her to a party and she was supposed to stay overnight at their place. In a certain moment, a man followed her into the room, pushed her onto the bed and began to aggressively kiss her, attempting to undress her. She managed to fend him off, but as the superintendent of Belize, Henry knew very well that wealthy foreigners like Jasmine, who frequented bars and clubs, were extremely vulnerable to attacks, especially beautiful women. Before dropping her off at home, Henry strongly urged her to consider obtaining a firearm permit. Just four days later, on Wednesday, May 26th, an opportunity arose for Jasmine to repay Henry for his kindness. Apparently, he had quarreled with his civilian wife and asked Jasmine to put him up in one of the hotel rooms to blow off some steam. He checked into the hotel with his friend Manuel Pacheco, who had recently been released from prison. Manuel had been accused of killing a neighbor, but despite shooting him four times in the back, the judge ruled it as self-defense. Some might say that Manuel wasn't the best company for a police superintendent, but such friendships spoke volumes about the state of affairs in Belize. Regardless, in the morning, Henry went fishing with another friend, Penny. According to Penny, Henry hadn't mentioned his breakup with his wife at all. However, when Penny asked about his plans for the evening, he playfully replied that he had a date. Penny couldn't contain his curiosity and tried to dig for more juicy details about the mysterious woman. But Henry kept his lips sealed, saying he would take that secret to the grave. The poor man didn't know how right he was. The silence of that night was shattered by the sound of a gunshot. Police officers who arrived at the scene found the wealthy Canadian, Jasmine Harton, covered in blood on the pier. In the water, about 10 meters from the shore, was the lifeless body of the beloved police officer, Henry Jemmett. Jasmine was in a state of shock. She initially told the police that someone from a passing boat had shot Henry. Given Belize's popularity among drug dealers, this didn't seem entirely implausible. Drug traffickers often dump contraband from boats into the water, which local dealers pick up. Jasmine was taken to the police station for questioning. Suddenly, she changed her statement, admitting that the gun had gone off accidentally while she was handling it. Her inconsistent statements, coupled with the discovery of a small amount of illegal substances in her purse, which she claimed were not hers, made her an unreliable witness. 
the wealthy socialite was arrested and sent to the central prison of Belize, considered one of the worst prisons in the world. Gradually, new details of that night began to surface. On May 27, 2021, Jasmine, Andrew, and Henry had agreed to meet at the hotel. At the last minute, Andrew couldn't join them, leaving Henry alone with Jasmine. They had some drinks and Henry was already slightly intoxicated. To avoid breaking the curfew imposed due to COVID and not to wake Manuel, they decided to head to the nearby pier. Before leaving, Henry made sure to bring his service weapon. When Jasmine questioned why he needed it, given their proximity to the hotel, he replied that he always carried it with him. They sat on the sun-warmed planks of the pier, listened to music, admired the beauty of the moon, and chatted while dangling their legs over the water. At one point, Henry unloaded his Glock 17 semi-automatic pistol and handed it to Jasmine. He suggested she learn how to insert the magazine to make her more comfortable with the firearm. Henry placed the rounds next to him, and Jasmine was convinced that there was now no ammunition in the gun. She obediently took the weapon and practiced inserting and removing the magazine, placing the pistol beside her. At some point, Henry complained of a sore neck after a whole day of fishing and asked Jasmine to give him a massage. While she lightly massaged his shoulders from behind, he suggested they return to the hotel and asked her to remove the magazine so he could load it with ammunition. Still sitting behind him, Jasmine took the gun and attempted to remove the magazine, as she had practiced earlier. However, it was challenging due to the moon being the only source of light. The gun was uncooperative. While she struggled with it, Henry, unaware of what was happening, savored his last moments, watching the waves break against the pier. Jasmine couldn't even recall if her finger was on the trigger, but suddenly, the gun discharged. Henry made no sound. He simply collapsed onto Jasmine, pinning her to the pier. She remembers the sensation of warmth spreading across her clothes. She didn't immediately realize it was Henry's blood. Eventually, she managed to free herself from beneath him, but her attempts caused his body to slip into the dark waters of the sea. She didn't know what to do, whether he was dead or alive, but she hurriedly contacted the police. Amidst Jasmine's claims that she was learning how to handle firearms, there were photos and videos showing her expertly shooting more powerful weapons. However, she explained that these images were taken for show, and she was never allowed to reload the firearms. Furthermore, dozens of attempts where she failed to hit the target were not posted online. The court date for Jasmine was set for June 9, 2021. The delicate blonde stood before the judge and firmly insisted that the shooting had been an unfortunate accident. It's possible that poor visibility, a jammed slide, or her inexperience with firearms contributed to the incident. Posts on social media where she was photographed with firearms raised doubts about her story. David Katz, a former DEA agent and experienced firearms instructor, offered his expert opinion that the way Jasmine handled the Glock 17 could have easily led to an accidental discharge, especially in the context of alcohol intoxication. Henry and Jasmine might have removed the magazine but forgotten that there was still one round in the chamber. It's worth noting that the Glock 17 lacks a conventional safety lever. Many other handguns have safety mechanisms that prevent the firearm from firing even if the trigger is pulled unless the safety is disengaged. However, the Glock's safety is built into the design of the trigger itself, allowing for a quicker response when needed by law enforcement officers. This means that if someone mishandles a Glock as Jasmine demonstrated, an accidental discharge is possible. David Katz explained that when a person squeezes one finger, the muscles of the other fingers contract as well. Therefore, Jasmine could have unintentionally pressed the trigger and fired the gun without realizing it. That's why it's crucial to learn to keep the finger away from the trigger unless intentionally firing the weapon. Based on the evidence and Jasmine's statements, the prosecutors decided not to pursue charges of premeditated murder. Instead, she was charged with manslaughter, a crime that carries a maximum punishment of nine months in prison, but more often results in a fine of $5,000. However, Henry's family and friends vehemently disagree with this decision. They believe that what happened was murder. Henry's older sister, who is also a deputy superintendent, is certain that her brother, an experienced police officer and instructor, would never have discharged his weapon while under the influence of alcohol, let alone allow someone else to do so. In her opinion, the shot to the head behind his right ear closely resembles a cold-blooded execution. Some family members even suspect that Jasmine lured Henry to the pier, where he was ambushed and killed by Andrew. 
They are convinced that charges should not have been filed against Jasmine until the forensic evidence was fully analyzed. Moreover, her hands were not tested for gunpowder residue. Instead, they were disinfected due to COVID-19 protocols. Such serious procedural violations could potentially impact the outcome of the case. However, the police argue that they had to either release her or file charges at that moment. Jasmine Harton was released on bail on the day of her court appearance. The money for her bail was provided by her friend and hotel manager, Frank Haben. She was compelled to pay nearly $15,000, surrender her passport, check in daily with the police, and adhere to a strict curfew. Throughout the unfolding of this fiasco, where was Jasmine Harton's boyfriend, millionaire Andrew Ashcroft? He seemingly kept his distance from his significant other as much as possible, likely out of fear of negative headlines in the press, which are often associated with such cases unless he had more sinister reasons to avoid her. Regardless, their relationship fell apart alongside Henry's tragic death and gave way to a scandal when Andrew illegally barred Jasmine from entering their home or seeing their children. After her release on bail, she expected to return home, but instead, she was taken to a remote house where her family, children, and even her phone were absent. Unsurprisingly, after three weeks, she confronted Andrew and caused a scene. Jasmine requested police accompaniment, but they refused. So, she armed herself with a camera and recorded herself following Andrew through the hotel, questioning why he wouldn't allow her to see the children. During this confrontation, she allegedly pushed a hotel employee, which resulted in her being arrested for assault on June 22nd. Her behavior led her friend Frank Haben to doubt that she would show up in court, so he withdrew her bail. Consequently, Jasmine Harton found herself back in prison, separated from the wealth of the Ashcrofts, until her bail was reinstated a week later. In addition to this scandal, Jasmine managed to stay out of the press's eye until May 19, 2022, when she was accused of ordering the murder of the Belize police chief and a judge who was handling a custody case involving twins. Among local residents, rumors began to circulate that she had turned to a local gang to eliminate the officials. She was arrested again. However, if possible, everything turned out to be much more convoluted. The rumors were quickly traced back to their source, a former employee of Jasmine, Lionel Neal. Two days before Jasmine's arrest, she accused him of attempting to assault her, threatening her, and blackmailing her. She resisted him, but he promised to falsely incriminate her with the police if she didn't pay him. It's not surprising that when he was arrested, he did just that. Neil told the police that he and Jasmine had a romantic relationship and even lived together for seven months. Furthermore, she allegedly expressed a desire for the police chief and the judge's deaths. Neil's statements had no basis, and he himself had long been known to the police, having escaped prosecution after a murder case. He had also been accused of robbery and violence. Jasmine remained in custody until her new lawyer, Dickie Bradley, posted bail for her. Jasmine's lawyer, Dickie Bradley, was astonished that she had been arrested on such flimsy charges and criticized the police for believing a violent criminal and robber. Her family believes that the biased treatment and one-sided media coverage are due to the influence of her former boyfriend. Considering that Jasmine and Andrew were fighting for custody at that time, these accusations appear intriguing. Was all of this a conspiracy to destroy Jasmine's reputation and distance the twins, heirs to the Ashcroft title, from a bad reputation? Rumors or reality, it worked. Jasmine's name was dragged through the mud once again, and she lost the custody battle. Andrew immediately took them to Turks and Caicos, leaving his former lover without children, family, or money. However, amid tabloid headlines and scandals, Henry Jemmet, a loving son, brother, and father of five, a 23-year-old foreman who worked for the Belize police was overshadowed and shot one evening on a pier on a paradise island. Jasmine repeatedly stated that Henry was her friend, and it was a terrible accident. She admits that not a day goes by when she doesn't ache in her heart for his children, family, and him. Not a day goes by when she doesn't cry over the loss of her friend and the pain his family is going through. She wishes she could turn back time and change everything. While the world awaits the trial, his loved ones are waiting for justice in this case. Only two people know what happened on that pier that night, and one of them is no longer alive. These are the main facts of this case. Was it a murder or a terrible mistake? At first glance, Jasmine Harton had no motive to kill the Belize police chief. Rumors circulated about their romantic involvement, but they were just rumors. 
They only surfaced after his death, and many locals, including Henry's family, deny them. Even if a hidden motive did exist, why would a high-profile socialite known to everyone personally shoot him on the street and then hire a hitman to get rid of the police chief and judge? The idea seems strange, although murder itself can never be justified. On the other hand, if Henry's death was indeed an accident, why did Jasmine attempt to evade the San Pedro detectives? Did she lie, knowing that the strange circumstances of his death would lead to false murder charges against her? Was she trying to distance herself from a scandal that would inevitably make international headlines? Or did something much more sinister occur on that Friday night on the pier? This is a million-dollar question, and perhaps it will be answered in court. On May 13, 2015, around 5 p.m., firefighters extinguished a raging fire in a garage by the roadside in the village of Sand Lake, Michigan. At that moment, a frightened woman ran up to their vehicle, shouting that her neighbors were dead. Several firefighters hurried with the woman to her neighbor's house. In the bedroom, lying on the floor in a pool of blood, were two lifeless bodies. It appeared that they had been shot. To preserve the evidence of the crime scene, the firefighters refrained from touching anything and immediately informed the police that they had found two bodies and required investigators and forensic experts. Forensic experts had been working at the crime scene for about an hour, collecting evidence and photographing the bodies of 46-year-old Martin Durham and 47-year-old Glenna Durham when one officer noticed a slight movement in Glenna's chest. Just a tiny bit. He rushed to her body and tried to feel for a pulse. But before he could touch her, Glenna's eyes opened wide, and she sat up abruptly, screaming, What are you doing, Marty? The officer immediately called for paramedics, who transported the injured woman to the local hospital. Marty and Glenna first met as teenagers in the early 1980s. Marty invited the girl on a date to a local open-air theater, where they lost their virginity on the very same evening, with little interest in the movie itself. Their relationship progressed quickly and passionately, but they broke up after a few months, partly because 17-year-old Glenna was married. Soon Marty started a family of his own. Christina Keller was 14 years old when she met 19-year-old Marty at a party held at his house. The young man seemed charming and fun to the girl, but also a little strange because he immediately declared that he would marry her someday. The next day, Marty showed up at her doorstep. Apparently, he made a favorable impression on Christina's parents because after that, he never left her life. Their friendship developed into a romantic relationship, and soon 16-year-old Christina discovered that she was expecting their first child. Within two years, she was carrying their second son, which prompted the young couple to get married. Eleven months later, Christina gave her husband a daughter. Christina was 19 and Marty was 24 at the time. Initially, the young family lived with relatives, but in early 1995, Marty obtained a higher paying job at a factory in Michigan, and the family of five moved there. However, on the evening of February 16, 1995, while returning from work, Marty was involved in a car accident. Another vehicle, speeding through a red light, collided with his car. The larger vehicle practically crushed Marty's car, trapping him inside. Marty was taken to the hospital, where he was in a clinically dead state for about five minutes. The left side of his body suffered severe injuries, and he remained in a coma for over three weeks. When he finally regained consciousness, he had no recollection of his wife, children, or much of his past life. He spent a year and a half learning to walk, speak, eat, and take care of himself again. Throughout this time, Christina supported him. Physically, Marty increasingly resembled his former self, but psychologically, he had changed. Due to the brain trauma, he experienced bouts of rage. He never raised his hand against his wife and children but became a domineering person. Even his sense of humor became darker. In 2000, almost five years after the accident, Christina filed for divorce. She still cared deeply for her husband, 
but her feelings had transformed into more of a maternal nature, as she took on the role of his caregiver and could no longer relate to him in any other way. In May 2001, Marty purchased his first home using the funds he received from the insurance company, along with a bank loan. The house was located in the small village of Sand Lake, Michigan, where only 500 people reside. Marty was incredibly proud of his new home, where he moved in with his two sons and an African grey parrot named Bud. Two months after moving into the house, Marty was surprised by a knock on his door from a 16-year-old girl, who claimed to be his daughter. Marty asked who her mother was, and it turned out to be Glenna, his first love. The girl knew that her mother had had an affair early in her marriage, and she was born a few months later. She wanted to establish her paternity for certain. A DNA test confirmed that the girl was indeed Marty's biological daughter, born out of wedlock. This revelation led to the rekindling of Marty and Glenna's relationship, despite Glenna still being married. Clearly, Glenna had never been able to forget Marty, as she had a tattoo with his name on her arm throughout her marriage. Glenna divorced her husband and moved in with Marty. They were very happy together and soon had a new wedding ceremony. Glenna's new husband meant everything to her. The couple spent all their time together, visiting family, and going to the local casino once or twice a week. Even when Marty went hunting, Glenna would sit in the car and read a novel. Officially taking on the responsibility of caring for her husband, Glenna received $3,200 per month for her services. Marty's disability benefits amounted to over $1,000 per month. Additionally, Glenna sold excess medication from Marty, so their monthly income was approximately $5,000. When Marty's sons moved out, this income was sufficient for their life in the small village. However, by 2010, Marty's health, both mental and physical, had deteriorated significantly. The couple continued to spend all their time together and with their friends, including Connie and Keith Ream, another neighboring couple. On Monday, May 11, 2015, Marty offered to mow the lawn in Connie and Keith's backyard. He enjoyed doing this work and did it completely free of charge. Later that evening, all four of them, Connie, Keith, Marty, and Glenna, sat on the neighbor's terrace, and the Durhams returned home around 9 p.m. The next day, on Tuesday, at 8.26 a.m., Keith sent Marty a message asking how he was feeling, but he didn't receive a response. This was strange because Marty always promptly answered calls and messages. Throughout the day, Keith sent several more messages to his friend with the same result. Later that day, Connie approached the neighbor's door and knocked. She heard the Shelby family's dog barking, but no one opened the door. Keith even sent a joking message to Glenna saying, what did you do to Marty? Of course, she didn't respond to him either. On Wednesday, at 7.30 am, Connie approached the neighbor's house again and rang the doorbell. The only response she received was the dog barking. She walked around the house, checking if any doors or windows were open. Everything was locked as usual. Throughout the day, Connie and Keith tried to contact their neighbors, becoming increasingly worried. After work, around 4.30 p.m., Connie approached the neighbor's house for the third time and knocked. She was sure she would have to break the door, but to her surprise, when she touched the handle, she discovered that the door was not locked this time. Connie cautiously opened the door and called out for the neighbors. But at the door, she was only met by the Shelby family pet who led her into the living room where there was a gruesome mess. Documents and photographs were scattered everywhere, a broken lamp, and other items were in disarray. Following Shelby into the bedroom, Connie found the homeowners lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Marty was only in his underwear, while Glenna was fully dressed, with her legs covered by a blanket. Connie rushed out of the neighbor's house and ran towards a fire truck she noticed further down the road. Marty was not as lucky as his wife. Five bullets that hit his back, forearm, and chest left him no chance of survival. He had been dead for several days. Glenna was shot twice, with both shots hitting the area behind her right ear. 
Blood was found not only in the bedroom, but also on the chair in the living room and on a pillow with two bullet holes. Underneath the chair, a gun and two empty shells were found. In the bedroom, there were five more shell casings one near the door and four near Marty's body, totaling seven in total. However, the gun found near the chair was designed for six bullets. This means that the perpetrator found time to reload the gun before continuing the shooting. Apart from the living room and bedroom, the rooms in the house appeared completely normal. There were no signs of forced entry, and in the kitchen, there was a bowl of spaghetti and a piece of garlic bread on the table. Later that same evening, when Glenna was taken to the hospital, Marty's children were allowed to take the family pets, a dog and a parrot, and bring them to their mother's house, Christina. Although the children were only permitted to take the pets, the trio did not miss the opportunity to search the house and discovered a sealed envelope with the word personal written on it. Inside, they found letters from Glenna addressed to her children and ex-husband. In the letters, she expressed her love for the children and asked for their forgiveness for not being the best mother. She also asked her ex-husband to take care of the children. Additionally, in Glenna's drawer, they found a packet of unpaid bills. They handed over all the findings to the police. The investigators began questioning the family's relatives and friends about their relationships and financial situation. They loved spending time together and were truly absorbed in each other's company. However, it soon became clear that they were facing serious financial difficulties. Glenna was in charge of the family's accounts, and relatives believed that Marty was unaware of the severity of their situation because he was quite frugal. On the other hand, Glenna had developed a serious addiction to gambling. She would spend hundreds of dollars on lottery tickets and lose thousands of dollars at the casino. But whenever her husband approached her, she would pretend to be playing with one dollar bills. She played every week, and in 2010 alone, Glenna spent $75,000 on her addiction. The family had fallen behind on tax payments, had credit card debt, and Marty's car was on the verge of being repossessed. However, the most pressing issue was their home. Glenna hadn't made mortgage payments for over a year, and they had accumulated a debt of $48,000. In early April 2015, a few weeks before the attack on the family, Marty's mother saw a list of homes that would be seized due to debts, and Marty's address was listed there. She called Glenna, who assured her that the newspaper had printed the wrong address and that she would sort it out. Of course, it turned out that their home was indeed being taken away. Despite the fact that Marty had taken out the mortgage, on April 28, Glenna received a notice that their home would be auctioned if they didn't pay $5,000. Interestingly, the auction was scheduled for May 12, just a day before Marty and Glenna were found by their neighbor. The investigators concluded that Marty was unaware of the impending loss of their home because he had been renovating it for the past two months. Just two days before their deaths, he had painted the bathroom. After three days in the intensive care unit, Glenna regained consciousness. She had no recollection of the day of the murders or the preceding days. She couldn't even remember writing the letters to her children and ex-husband. Since the eyewitness couldn't provide any helpful information, the police had few leads or clues to work with. The weapon contained multiple DNA samples, as Marty was an avid hunter and often showed his firearms to friends. However, Glenna and Marty also sold drugs, for which they received cash payments, and large sums of money were stored in envelopes in a safe. Could this have been an unplanned robbery? The living room was in disarray, as if someone had been searching for something, and the cash from the safe was indeed missing. This version of events seemed the most plausible, but finding the killer among the clients of their illegal activities was like looking for a needle in a haystack. A whole year passed before an unexpected witness helped solve the case. It was a 19-year-old parrot named Bud, who had been living with Christina for the past 12 months. Bud was an African grey parrot and had the unique ability of not only mimicking sounds and words he heard in his environment but also imitating human voices. Originally, 
he was Christina's beloved pet, but Marty took him, presumably as a way to get back at his ex-wife for leaving him. Upon returning to his beloved owner, Bud started reproducing various conversations he had heard while living with Marty, such as how Marty played with the dog. But at some point, he began repeating an argument between a man and a woman. They were clearly arguing with each other, raising their voices and occasionally mixing profanity with regular words, and at the end of the dialogue, a male voice shouted clearly, No, no, don't shoot. Christina recorded this scene performed by the parrot on video but didn't report it to the police, thinking it would be laughed off. However, when a local journalist interviewed Marty's mother a year after his murder, she mentioned the video. The journalist became very interested and aired it on the news. The video quickly went viral, and the increased public attention forced the police to reopen the case and focus their attention on one suspect, Glenna Durham. They examined Marty and Glenna's phones and discovered that the last thing Marty did on his phone was search for information about lawnmowers on the evening of the 11th, after they returned home from the neighbors. The examination of Glenna's phone turned out to be much more intriguing. It had been used until the 13th, the day the bodies were found. From 3.32 am to 4.48 am, someone used the phone five times to find information about the gun used in the shootings, including how to reload it. The last message was sent to Glenna's mother at 4.48 am and said, I love you, forgive me. Glenna was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. She insisted on her innocence, and her lawyer tried to prove that another family member or a stranger had broken into the house to steal medication, cash, or Marty's weapons. However, the forensic experts did not find any signs of forced entry into the house. And what about the money from the safe? It turned out that Marty's children had taken it while they were searching the house when Glenna was taken to the hospital and their father to the morgue. When investigators accidentally learned about this, they stated that nobody had asked them about the money at the police station, so they didn't say anything. In any case, the version of a robber was discarded because nothing was stolen. The prosecution's version of events painted a much more plausible picture. Here's what they believed happened. Since Marty was in his underwear, he could have been killed on the morning of the 12th. The man must have learned about the inevitable loss of the house, became very upset, and a heated argument ensued. When Glenna grabbed the weapon, Marty turned and tried to run into the bedroom. She shot him in the back. Marty was still on his feet, reaching for another weapon in the bedside table. Glenna fired again, hitting his forearm. Only then did he turn to face her, and she sent three more bullets into his chest. Marty fell lifeless on the bedroom floor. Glenna spent the whole day doing paperwork. She wrote letters to her ex-husband, and children and prepared spaghetti for lunch. When the neighbor showed up at her house for the first time on the evening of the 12th, Glenna was still engaged in these activities. Understanding that the neighbors would start to worry about her and Marty, no matter what Glenna planned, she needed to act quickly. She settled into a chair in the living room, placed a pillow against her head, and fired. However, nothing happened. The pillow absorbed the force of the shot, and the bullet barely grazed her. Since it was the last bullet in the pistol, she had to look up online how to reload it. This means she did not attempt it again until the early morning of the 13th when she sent a message to her mother. Perhaps she still had doubts when Connie knocked on the door again at 7.30 am because the door was still locked. But when Connie left, Glenna must have unlocked the door, sat in the chair, took the pillow, and tried again. This time the injury turned out to be more serious, 
but as her doctor later explained, she did not hit any important veins, arteries, or penetrate the skull. It's hard to imagine what state she was in, but since head wounds always bleed profusely, she may have decided that she would simply bleed out. She made her way to the bedroom, where her husband's body had been lying all this time, and collapsed on the floor, covering her legs with a blanket. Whether she staged the scene when the police officer touched her or only regained consciousness at that moment is unknown. And we may never know because Glenna continues to claim memory loss. The jury believed the prosecution's version. On Wednesday July 19, 2017, after nine hours of deliberation, they found her guilty of murder. Glenna Durham was sentenced to life imprisonment. Of course, the parrot named Bada was not invited to court as a witness. And it's not because he swears terribly. It's simply impossible to prove that he didn't hear that particular dialogue on a TV show or the radio. Not to mention how he could take an oath in the witness stand. In other words, if Banner had participated in the process and less than 24 hours had passed since Glenna's guilty verdict, her lawyer would have filed an appeal. Suspecting a loved one of betrayal, many can reach their limit. While some might choose to break up against such suspicions, others will surrender to the power of fantasies for revenge on the betrayer. But what if these fantasies were to come to life with the help of a katana? This story took place in 2018 in Camas, Washington. The woman, who will be the subject of discussion, lived in a quiet neighborhood in an excellent house. The guy's name was Alex Lovell. The primary passion of 29-year-old Alex was computer games. He spent around 12 to 13 hours a day in front of the computer. Alex took his hobby so seriously that he regularly did exercises for his hands, wrists, and shoulders. He even practiced a special mouse control technique to enhance his effectiveness as a player or gamer. 30-year-old Emily Javier, Alex's girlfriend, did not like his obsession at all. The young couple had been together for two years, and during that time, Alex began to allocate less and less time to her, spending more and more time playing games. Naturally, this situation didn't sit well with Emily. Her patience dropped below the critical threshold when Alex decided he wanted to pursue professional gaming. While Emily was somewhat okay with sharing her boyfriend with games, she couldn't come to terms with a gaming competitor. Her resentment knew no bounds when she discovered the Tinder dating app on Alex's phone. This made her extremely suspicious, so when she noticed scratches on his back and red hairs in the shower, whereas her hair was dyed green at the time, she realized that Alex had found another girl. Instead of openly confronting him, convinced he would just deny everything, Emily began to devise a revenge plan that would allow her to get rid of him for good. She contemplated hiring a killer, buying poison, or getting a gun. No. She went to a shopping mall and bought a katana. Fueled by rage, that was the only thing she could come up with at the moment. So she decided to give herself another week to refine her plan alongside the katana. At home, she typed the query, how to kill someone with a sword into a search engine. And unsurprisingly, she received a relatively straightforward answer to her question. At the same time, the girl purchased plane tickets so that she and Alex could embark on their final trip to the Hawaiian Islands. She wrote two notes, one for her mother and a close friend, confessing that she was tired of life. She also wrote a note for Alex, but it's unclear when he was supposed to read it and what it contained. The impression was that initially she wanted to do something to herself during the vacation, but how was she planning to get revenge on Alex? Kill him as well? It's possible, especially since she could have taken the sword with her if she had checked it in with her luggage instead of carrying it as hand luggage. However, one evening, Alex returned home around 9 o'clock. He barely paid any attention to his girlfriend and just wanted to go to bed. This triggered emotions in Emily that she could no longer control. Believing she couldn't endure such treatment any longer, she hid the katana on her side of the bed and taped two more knives there in case her sword plan failed. After finishing her preparations, she returned to her boyfriend and offered him a drink to help him fall asleep faster. Under the influence of alcohol, when the man fell asleep quickly, Emily hid his phone, without which he wouldn't be able to call for help. Using her own phone as a light source, she illuminated his neck for better visibility, to aim more accurately. She reached for the katana. However, as she prepared to strike, she accidentally hit Alex on the head with the back of the katana, waking him up. 
Fueled by an adrenaline rush, Alex quickly regained his bearings and began blocking Emily's subsequent strikes with his hands and feet. Finally, he managed to restrain her in a firm grip. In his last moments of consciousness, he cried out that he loved her and couldn't believe she was trying to kill him. Nearly losing consciousness, Alex pleaded with her to call for help, or he would die. Strangely enough, Emily listened. On March 3rd at 1.54 a.m., a dispatcher answered a call from a hysterical girl. She was screaming that she had injured her boyfriend. 911, can I help you? I just stabbed my boyfriend. Okay, like and tell me, me tell me what happened. Okay, what? Okay, is he awake? He's dead, I think he's dead. Okay, what is your name? Emily. Okay, Emily, I need to get some help started. I'm splitting the call. Hold on, just one. Okay, stay on, Emily. Stay on the phone with me just a second, okay? Uh, Emily, stay on the phone. I'm, I'm splitting it for medical so we can get help started for you, okay? The dispatcher tried her best to extract any relevant information from her. She asked where the girl had wounded her boyfriend, to which Emily shouted, Everywhere! Everywhere! The dispatcher inquired about the whereabouts of the knife. To her astonishment, the girl replied that she had attacked her boyfriend with a samurai sword. The dispatcher urged her to return to the bedroom where her boyfriend was and to check if he was still breathing, advising her to apply bandages to his wounds. But Emily kept yelling that she couldn't go there. There was too much blood. Returning to reality, she realized that her boyfriend was indeed dying. In fact, she thought he might already be dead. Soon, officers arrived at the scene. They entered the bedroom where they found Alex curled up, covered in blood. His body had several life-threatening wounds, including deep gashes on his torso, neck, and the left side of his head. Emily had shattered his wrist, cut his legs, and almost severed three fingers on his hand. Alex was rushed to the hospital, and Emily was taken into custody. Tearfully and without resistance, she surrendered to the mercy of the justice system. Her bail was set at $350,000. Doctors counted 26 wounds on Alex's body. He had to undergo six major surgeries. They placed 150 staples on him, with 45 of those on his head alone. Yet the medical team performed a miracle and managed to reattach his fingers. Of course, he would have to visit a physical therapist for a long time, but the most important thing was that he survived. This attack generated a lot of attention in the United States and made headlines in many media outlets due to the choice of weapon by Emily the intensity with which she carried out the attack, and also thanks to Alex's remarkable resilience. He faced a lengthy recovery, but his attitude remained remarkably positive. Just a day after the attack, he humorously asked online if anyone could split an image where both he and Emily were pictured together. It's unclear how he managed to take the attack so lightly, but some of his statements were quoted multiple times by the media, for instance. I'm just so proud that I got my ass beat by a girl, and... I got my ass beat with a sword, man. I gotta give it up for her. I definitely learned my lesson. He adds, The feeling of when I overpowered her, there's no comparing it. I've played sports, won big tournaments, I've done all that. I've shown tricks on a snowboard. This is better. I overcame someone intent on evil and I felt that was the right thing. I'd prepared my whole life for something like this. Alex attributes his victory to his habit of competing against other gamers and his love for kung fu movies. He admits that he probably spent too much time in front of the monitor, but claims he never cheated on Emily. I barely had time for one girl, let alone another, he said. He was just too exhausted to show the love she deserved. He explained that Tinder was indeed on his phone, but he hadn't used it since it became clear that he and Emily were in a serious relationship. Alex even confessed to having a low libido due to fatigue from constant gaming. Perhaps this convinced Emily that she was no longer of interest to him. However, he claims she had baselessly accused him of cheating many times before, even when another girl simply liked his photo on social media. Emily denies all of this. As for the red hairs, they could have been his own from his beard or his dog's fur. In court, Emily had a difficult time defending herself. It was evident to everyone that this was a well-thought-out and planned crime. Emily herself admitted to officers, I wanted to kill him for cheating. That was my goal. She was found guilty of first-degree attempted murder. She faced a possible 20-year sentence, but due to her lack of prior convictions, Alex's survival, and her own call to 911 for help, her sentence was reduced to 19 years. 
Alex's family disagreed with this outcome. They believed she deserved a harsher punishment for attempting to kill their son. Emily, on the other hand, argued that her sentence should be shorter due to her history of childhood trauma, which made it difficult for her to build relationships with people. Her psychologist agreed that she suffered from PTSD, but stated that it was not relevant to the case. In the end, the judge ruled that due to the brutality of the attack, she should serve nearly the maximum sentence. She also has to undergo treatment for her mental health and aggression. She is prohibited from contacting Alex or his family and has to pay $30,000 in restitution. As for Alex, his gamer friends created a crowdfunding page for him, raising thousands of dollars for his recovery. He is currently recovering and has mostly returned to his normal life. When asked about his feelings towards Emily, he responds that he hasn't spoken to her since the attack. He acknowledges that she called 911 and saved his life, which means something, but expressing his feelings toward his ex-girlfriend in two words is challenging. Regardless, he believes she needs serious help. In his usual playful manner, he adds, I didn't expect this, but something like this had to happen. She clearly didn't want me to fall into someone else's hands, so she went for the samurai sword.